Um, fine. So, what viruses cause hepatitis? There are three common ones, and then we'll talk about some cooler causes. Three common groups, rather. <laughs> Not just three common ones. So, yeah, hepatitis. Yes, uh, so all of you have said a variety of he different hepatitis viruses. So A to E can all cause hepatitis. Hepatitis A to E, I mean, it's in the name. But other common causes, which you've also said, are Epstein-Barr virus and cytomegalovirus. Those are like the three big viral virus groups that cause hepatitis in this country. Um, viruses are kind of weird and they can cause kind of anything. So like HIV can also cause like a hepatitis. And patients with HIV are also more likely to have one of the hepatitis viruses as well. Um, which hepatitis is the chronic one that we're concerned about? Or which ones rather, because there's two of them. Yeah. So B and C are the two uh, two ones that can uh, that have like this chronic phase. I'm not going to cover hepatitis serology today, but like hepatitis B serology is really important and they love examining that. Um, so slightly rogue question. So I, I've just been, let's just say I've been on holiday, which I obviously haven't, um, to South America and I've come back and I've got a new uh, onset of like jaundice. What, what are you considering then infection wise? So yeah, so you can have hepatitis A is still probably the most common thing because you can get it from uh, food sources. Uh, the, and some parasites can also cause it, but that's not, there is a virus that is quite common in that area that can cause jaundice. It's kind of in the name of the virus. <laughs> Zika, Chaga. I love, I love how everyone learns really rogue diseases. Yeah, it's yellow fever. Yellow fever isn't that rogue. Um, so yellow fever is a common cause of like a hepatitis picture. Um, you don't need to know that much about yellow fever. It's basically supportive therapy. Uh, but if South America, you should definitely be thinking about yellow fever. Uh, notorious thing about yellow fever is if you're above the age of 60, you can't be vaccinated against it. People have died because of the yellow fever vaccine have been, been given it when they're older than 60. You don't need to know that, but someone died at the Royal Free a few months ago because of that. What's this? So there, th this is a presentation. There is like a differential diagnosis. So what is this presentation called? It's more a fifth year presentation, but like it's relevant in the in 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 the context of jaundice. Yeah, this is a subconjunctival hemorrhage, and there's lots of different causes of subconjunctival hemorrhage. Can you think of any reason why I'm talking about it in the context of jaundice. Um, episcleritis could look like this, but as I said, that's def that's not really that relevant for fourth year. So yeah, it's relevant because you could have a clotting abnormality, you could have like a bleeding disorder causing this kind of picture. Um, there is a specific infection that can cause this alongside jaundice that I'm looking for. Yes, yes, so leptospirosis, which we'll talk about in a minute. So causes of subconjunctival hemorrhage, you can split into causes of basically traumatic rupture of the vessels. Trauma to the eye can cause it, shaken baby syndrome can cause it, and whoop and cough, kids with that, because they cough and cough and cough and cough and their blood pressure increases because they keep coughing, um, they can get this hemorrhage. Any kind of bleeding disorder, whether that's like a liver problem or a hematological problem can cause it. And then, yeah, the infection we talked about, which is leptospirosis. So does anyone know what this picture shows? This is a special type of microscopy. Does anyone know what it is?
So this is dark field microscopy. Um, it is almost exclusively used for this condition. So leptospirosis is a spirochete carried by rodents, rats, more common than mice in like sewers, especially in like Asia. Um, it's a triad that you can remember because medicine is just full of triads. They get subconjunctival hemorrhage, jaundice. It's like a hepatic jaundice, but nobody really knows why. Like we don't really understand the cause. And they also get a, a acute renal failure. Diagnosis is this weird dark field microscopy thing. And then you just treat it with doxycycline. Any kind of weird infections you can treat with doxycycline. It's a great antibiotic. Um, most parasites are sensitive to it as well. Hence, you can use it for malaria. Anything weird and you don't know the answer, doxycycline is kind of a good answer. Fine. So congenital enzyme deficiencies is the next cause of prehepatic jaundice we're going to talk about. So remember there was, I gave you a tip about how to remember how things are inherited on Monday. Does anyone remember what I said about inheritance patterns? Yeah, so structural problems are inherited dominantly. Enzyme problems are inherited recessively. They don't ne it doesn't necessarily have to be autosomal recessive. It could be X-linked as well, but um, it, recessive. So these, these are recessive disorders. Uh, and there are two that you need to know of. And both of them are deficiencies in UDP glucuronyl transferase. All that means is we're unable to conjugate the bilirubin. Uh, so the first one we talked about is Gilbert's where there's a mild deficiency and any kind of stressor can cause this isolated rise in bilirubin. They tend to be otherwise pretty, pretty well. And then you have a more severe type called Crigler Najar. Uh, type one, they just have none of this enzyme, so they die as a child. And type two, it's less severe and you can extend their life with phenobarbital. There are two other really important enzyme deficiencies in the liver. Um, we're not I'm not going to talk about them, but Rota syndrome and Dubin Johnson syndrome, you should read up on. And the important question you want to ask yourself is how are these different to the two we talked about just now? What's different in their presentation? Um, fine. Is why does phenobarbital help these people? I don't have a clue. Uh, Ahmed, do you know? Do you have any idea why phenobarbital? Oh, I think in Krugler jar you can be increased seizure risk, and I think the seizures particularly respond to phenobarbital because it's not a particularly common drug because it's very dangerous. But I think it's the one that's found to be efficacious in Krugler jar. I'll go check up on that really quickly though. There we go. We'll get back to you. Um, all right. So here's another case for you. This is a 38-year-old lady. Oh, it lowers bilirubin levels in those patients. Interesting. I wonder why. I feel like I asked my left uh, one of the guys at UCH this last year, and he just never gave me an answer. It's sad. Thirty-eight-year-old fever, malaise, jaundice, hepatomegaly, and a family history of Graves' disease. What are you thinking about? Yeah, so like anyone with a history of other autoimmune disease, especially like uh, endocrinology, endocrinology autoimmune diseases, you want to think about autoimmune hepatitis. So this is, you just realized why I called down Maria. Yes, um, I tried. <laughs> this is an autoimmune condition, mainly affects young females. Um, and you can split it into three types, and each of them has specific antibodies that you can test for. Um, and I just want to make it clear that this is not that likely to come up in your exams, but only a quarter of these patients uh, present acutely jaundiced. Most of them have signs of chronic liver disease or like amenorrhea because the liver is still involved in the entire like sex hormone production pathways. Um, and investigations, yeah, your mainstay is going to be antibodies. You can do a biopsy and you get something called piecemeal necrosis if that comes up in an SBA. 
management, it's autoimmune, so management is the same as every other autoimmune condition is steroids and then disease modifying agents like azathioprine. Eventually, they might actually require a liver transplant, which is rough. Hmm. So here's a quick cheat sheet I made on some hepatic enzymes. Um, like, this is the very bare minimum you need to know about LFTs. You probably need to know a bit more, but like, this is the bare minimum you definitely need to know. ALT and AST are hepatic enzymes, which mean that when they're raised, there's a hepatic pathology. ALP and gamma GT are bile duct enzymes. So when those are raised, there's a problem in the bile duct. If the problem in the bile duct is severe enough that it tracks up to the liver, they can also get a, they can get a mixed picture from both where both sets of enzymes are raised. So just keep that in mind. So here is another lady. Yeah, the liver is just. Uh, do you also get amenorrhea and liver cirrhosis? That's a good question. I can't remember. I'll check for you. Read this case in the meantime. So what sign is shown in this photo? Yeah, so these are xanthelasma. And what set of conditions do like things like xanthelasma and xanthomata usually go along with? This isn't the answer to this question, but like what set of conditions are they common in? Or what are those? Yeah, so hyperlipidemias is what you're usually thinking about. So this person has these, but she also has a massively raised ALP and a slightly raised ALT. What could be causing that? Uh, James, uh, amenorrhea can occur in late stage cirrhosis, by the way. So obstruction is, obstruction could very, very well do that. It would cause a increased ALP, biliary obstruction, because ALP is a biliary enzyme. But she doesn't, she's not actually jaundiced yet. Um, it could well be fatty liver disease. That's another important thing it, this could be. And PSC or PBC, yes. Yeah, so it could be one of those as well. So in this case, this lady actually has um, PBC. Yeah, gallstones would cause obstruction, so it could be gallstones. Um, so PBC is a chronic inflammatory condition of the bile canaliculi. They get destroyed because of this chronic inflammation. And this is a slightly confusing condition. So this is a hepatic cause of jaundice that causes obstruction. So you get an obstructive jaundice, but it's due to hepatic the canaliculi within the liver and it's generally it's generally going to be affecting these middle-aged females i think past med uses the rule of m's or some nonsense that i can't remember but yeah that's usually quite remember, useful um so remember that this is an obstructive jaundice but the problem is within the liver itself and the may it, it goes along with this antibody is it the f's yeah, I can't remember. If you remember the way past med users, someone posted it in the chat, it might be useful. Um, and like it goes along with these IgM anti-mitochondrial antibodies. Eventually, it's going to lead to cirrhosis. It used to be called primary biliary cirrhosis, but it has since been changed. Um, management is with ursodeoxycholic acid. Again, I don't really know how that works. And eventually, when they drop into cirrhosis, they might require a transplant again. Uh, and they get all of these other complications. So what is sicker syndrome? Yeah, I can't remember. I don't know about the 4F, sorry. Yeah, it is the three Ms. IgM, anti-mitochondrial antibodies, middle-aged female. Yeah. Yeah, sicker, dry mucous membranes. So you get dry eyes, dry mouth. You can get basically all of the glands that usually secrete mucousy type things stop secreting it. Um, 
All right. So malabsorption, what kind of problems can we get with due to malabsorption? What kind of pathologies are caused by malabsorption? So scurvy, if you don't absorb vitamin C, weight loss and nutrient deficiencies, yes. So scurvy is vitamin C deficiency, pernicious anemia is B12 deficiency. So in this case, you wouldn't get pernicious anemia, you would get B12 deficiency. Pernicious anemia is a specific cause of B12 deficiency. That being said, it is an autoimmune condition, which means it's associated with other autoimmune conditions. So you might also have pernicious anemia. I mean, it's not like a well-known association, but producing antibodies against one thing increases your risk of producing antibodies against another thing. Um, you can get, you can possibly get clotting disorders. You can get anemia. Yeah. Um, and just remember that any cause of inflammation within the liver can eventually cause hepatocellular carcinoma. Where does xanthal asthma fit in this picture? So um, ladies with um, primary biliary cholangitis often do get xanthal asthma and xanthomata. Um, I think it's uh, partially due to uh, the lack of, well, lower efficiency of the liver to um, manage cholesterol generally. I'm not sure of the exact etiology, but it's common in this condition. Is that okay? So, uh, and then the last big category of jaundice is post-hepatic, which is basically just obstructive jaundice. Um, and it's mostly painful. There is one important example where it is not painful. Um, does anyone know what example of obstructive jaundice is painless? Cancer. Which cancer? Yeah, pancreatic cancer is painless jaundice. And what's that? Si uh, what's the sign that you um, you elicit on examination for pancreatic cancer? Corvazio's sign, which is like a smooth, painless mass in the right upper quadrant. Um, what are the giveaway features before you test? I've asked you this question so many times. So when you examine them, what are the giveaway features that it's a post hepatic or obstructive jaundice? Pale stools. So yeah, they can get pur pruritus ex again, but, um, but the big ones are pale stools and dark urine. Um, and biochemically, what are the abnormalities you'll find with, with obstructive jaundice? ALP more affected than ALT and ASD, so ALP and gamma GT are high. Um, always be careful if ALP is rised, because remember ALP is also produced by the bones. Um, fine. And is this going to be conjugated or unconjugated bilirubin? Yeah, conjugated. Yeah, exactly. Fine. And does anyone have a good way of categorizing obstruction? This works for any kind of obstruction, not just biliary obstruction, but like, well, uh, can anyone think of a good way of doing it? Yeah, exactly. So intramural, mural, extramural, or luminal, mural, and extraluminal. So is it within the tube itself? Is it within the wall of the tube or is it a, a pressure effect from something outside the tube? Um, so can anyone think of problems within the bile duct that can cause obstruction? Gallstones, yeah, exactly. So it's gallstones. Um, what about any problems that are within the wall of the wall of the biliary tree? So neoplasia, yeah. What, what's that called? Yeah, that's called cholangiocarcinoma. Um, what else? What ha well, what other pathologies exist within the wall rather than within the thing? Um, so not PBC because PBC is the canaliculi, not the not the actual ducts. But yeah, PSC causes stricturing. Um, exactly. And what kind of things can put pressure on the um, duct from the outside and cause an obstruction via that mechanism? 
we've talked about one of them already. So pancreatic tumors, more specific, more commonly the pancreatic head tumors will do it. What else? There's one other big category of things that can do it. They are found all around the body and can enlarge in certain conditions. Yeah, lymph nodes. Yeah, exactly. Um, so if anyone ever has like massive lymph nodes, what is the one diagnosis you should always be ruling out if they have lots of lymph nodes all around the body enlarged? What do you need to rule out? Yeah, lymphoma, exactly. Um, perfect. Um, what are some other big causes of enlarged lymph nodes? Just generally. Both, it can be localized or generalized. So infection, yeah, if it's if, especially in like localized lymph nodes, what else? Uh, so I think leukemias can do it as well. Sarcoid is a big cause of lymphadenopathy. Uh, HIV, as, yeah, especially as they're seroconverting, but you don't really need to know about that, but yeah, HIV for sure. So lots of different causes. Um, also, don't forget tuberculosis because lots of things. So malaria, malaria is less is is one of the causes of massive splenomegaly. Let's talk. Uh, let's just diverge for a second. What are the big causes of massive splenomegaly? There's there's a few causes. So you there's like splenomegaly, which is caused by a lot of conditions, and then there's massive splenomegaly. Chronic myeloid leukemia is one of the causes of massive splenomegaly. What else? V yeah, visceral specifically visceral leishmaniasis is one of the causes of massive splenomegaly. What else? Myelofibrosis, yes. And then there's one other super, super rare condition. Yeah, I, I freaking knew Izzy was going to say it. Yeah, lysosomal storage diseases. Um, the only one they'll probably give you is gauches because they're like pretty stable. Um, does that make sense? You know that list of four. It's a useful differential diagnosis. Um, it reminds me, last year uh, at the free, we were taken to see a patient who apparently had massive splenomegaly and everyone in my bedside teaching was like, oh yeah, we can feel the spleen. It wasn't a spleen, it's a huge tumor. It, it was just terrible. And we all just said, yeah, 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 it's the spleen. And the, the consultant we were with, we just burst out laughing. It's just terrible. Um, fine. I put gallstones and PSC in bold because those are the two we're going to talk about today because uh, um, I don't want to bore you. Uh, gallstones can occur in four main locations. What are the four locations? I've cheated for one of, well, for two of them. So yeah, they can be in the gallbladder itself and they can be in another part of the gallbladder. So common bowel duct is another one. They can be in the hepatic duct and they can be in the ampulla vata, yeah. I also like splitting it into the neck of the gallbladder and the gallbladder itself uh, because they present very differently. What is, some, what is it called when someone has a gallstone in their gallbladder but not, it's not blocking the gallbladder? What's that called? Does anyone know? This will be a test of your Latin, I guess. Yeah, so this is cholelithiasis. Maritzi syndrome, I think, is something different. Um, I can't remember what that is. Ahmed, what's Maritzi syndrome? That came up last year. So Maritzi syndrome is when you have a gallstone within your gallbladder that's compressing the common bile oh, yeah. inside yeah. your gallbladder. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what it is. That's super rare, by the way. But that's good knowledge, but it's super, super rare. Um, yeah, it's called cholelithiasis. They are in pain because they have stones in their bladder. They're usually symptom-free. They might not even be in pain all the time. Okay, what about what's it called when they've got one in the neck of their gallbladder? Yeah, so this is cholecystitis. So there's a blockage of the gallbladder contents being put into the common bowel duct and the gallbladder duct, whatever that was called, the cystic duct. Um, note that there is no jaundice in these and it's a constant pain. Those are the two important features here. Um, 
and you'll see in a minute for those of you that haven't done gastro why it's different for the others so if you've got a problem in the common bowel duct there's two different pathologies that can happen i thought cholecystitis was when you have inflammation of the gallbladder you do have inflammation due to the blockage because the contents of the gallbladder remain within them there's like a pressure buildup as well so you do get inflammation the, the inflammation is what is going to cause the pain and the fever um you can get you can get gallstone formation um in the neck without inflammation as well um and you can get inflammation without a gallstone being stuck in the neck um cholangitis is slightly different and we'll talk about it in a minute where's the shared drive that you mentioned on the slides i'll send it it's on the group i'll put it out in the end uh, we'll talk about this in a minute. So, right, there's two main things that happen in the common bile duct. So, what are the two things that happen in the common bile duct? So, you can have you can have a stone lodged in the common bile duct, and what's that called? That's called cholecystitis. And then when you get a superimposed E. coli infection on top of that, which isn't that common, but they love testing you about it, it's called ascending cholangitis. Can someone break down the Latin? Absolutely. Um, so, cholei doco lithiasis. Lithiasis means stone formation. Cholei means the biliary system. Doco is the duct. Does that make sense for cholei doco lithiasis? That's the most complicated one. Likewise, when you just have stone formation within the gallbladder, you just it's just called cholelithiasis because chole is the biliary system and you've got a stone, but it's not in the duct. Um, and then ascending cholangitis is you have an infection spreading upward from a, through the biliary system. Why is it called ascending cholangitis specifically? Does anyone know? Yeah, so it's because the infection tracks up to the gallbladder, but yeah, more specifically, it's because it tends to come up from the GI tract. That's where the E. coli tends to come up from. Um, that's precisely what. And what triad of symptoms would you say? What's the name given to the triad of fever, obstructive jaundice, and right upper quadrant pain? Yeah, Charcot's triad is what that's called. And they love asking you about that as well. Um, so this is the main difference between cholecystitis and ascending cholangitis. One, there is no infection. They just have a gallstone within the common bile duct. The other one, they have an infection and inflammation on top of that. When you have a stone in the gallbladder neck, you can be asymptomatic for a while, but ev like eventually you are quite, when it gets completely blocked, you'll get cholecystitis because it can't expulge any contents into the rest of the biliary system. Does that make sense? When you say gallbladder neck. Yeah, it's effectively the same as blocking the cystic duct. Yeah. It, it's physiologically the same effect. Or Hartman's pouch. So I th Hartman's pouch is near the exit of the gallbladder, right? Sorry, remind me of my anatomy. I'm an old fifth year. Yeah, Hartman's pouch is towards the exit of the gallbladder, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so like it, it's effectively the same thing physiologically. Having a gallbladder in either of those areas causing complete obstruction will effectively cause the same thing. But eventually you'll get inflammation and you'll get a cholecystitis type picture. And what happens when you get a gallstone in the joining of the pancreatic and common bile ducts or the ampulla vata? This is probably the most important thing to uh, want to know out of the four of these. Yeah, so this is pancreatitis um, because the pancreatic enzymes can't get out into the small intestine. They'll stay within the pancreas and they'll start uh, a process which is effectively autodigestion of the pancreas, um, which is a, an emergency, to be frankly honest. These patients are very unwell. 
Um, okay, and while we're so gallstones can then go out into the small bowel, what can that cause? Because that's the way. If they if they exit the bowel duct, that's the way they're going to go. What does that call, uh, cause? So, yeah, it causes obstruction via a process called gallstone ileus. It just it's a functional issue where the gallstone stops the small bowel from conducting peristalsis, uh, which can cause small bowel obstruction. Yeah, exactly. Um, while we're on pancreatitis, what are the causes of pancreatitis? Don't just write the acronym. Everyone loves just writing. So what's G? Gallstones. What's A? Alcohol. Ethanol. A, alcohol. What is, or, or uh, what's L? What's the first L? Oh, wait, what? No, it's E. I, I was just spelling the wrong thing in my head. Sorry, I'm tired. And what's T? I was spelling gallstones in my head and I was like, wait, this doesn't work. What's T? Ta T is trauma. So any severe trauma can cause it as well. Um, what's S? Scorpions. Which ones? If you if you tell me which score, you, you gotta tell me which uh, yeah the ones from Trinidad and Tr Tobago yeah, um, M, mumps yes which is a viral infection, uh, A, autoimmune causes there are two important autoimmune causes of pancreatitis, what are they? You don't need to know anything about them really except for the fact that they cause pancreatitis. So one of them is a vasculitis. One of them is a disorder that you don't need to know anything about except for the fact that it causes pancreatitis. Yeah, IgG4 disease is the one you don't need to know about except for the fact that it causes pancreatitis. That's what, that's actually now an increasingly common cause of pancreatitis. Um, and the other one is polyarthritis nodosa. Um, what's the other S? So the two causes of autoimmune pancreatitis, let me just type them. So the other S is steroids, exactly. For the love of God, don't go and don't go up and look up by GG for disease. It's a mess. Um, steroids is the other S. H. This is such a long acronym. I forgot how long it was. hypercalcemia, hypothermia, and one other one. One other hyper... hyperlipidemia or hypertriglyceridemia. Yeah, exactly. So high calcium, high fats, low temperature are the big three um, in terms of those. Uh, what's the other E? We already, someone already said ERCP. And what's D? So D is the one that people are going to give me a category, but then are going to forget the cause, the actual drugs. Yeah, so drugs. So which drugs specifically? Please don't say steroids. I'm going to cry. So some sulfur drugs can do it and I think azathioprine can do it but the important ones for, the important ones for you are actually the diabetic medication that can cause pancreatitis although it's really rare so which diabetic medication is most likely to cause pancreatitis or another question so I so which set of drugs increase insulin uptake uh, increase insulin production from the pancreas
So I think these can as well. So sulfonylureas are an important cause because they're a really, really good diabetic medication. And one and their most severe side effect is um, pancreatitis. The other ones are also correct. Um, any of the ones that increase pancreatic insulin uh, production can cause pancreatitis. All right, that was a big tangent. Let's get back to this. What do we do with gallstones? What, what are the investigations we can do for gallstones? There are two images. Yeah, so ultrasound of the abdomen is the best test that's uh, freely available. And then you can also do MRCP mm, sometimes. Um, and then what do we do with gallstones if they're symptomatic? Yeah, you do ERCP if it's symptomatic. Uh, and don't forget to give them pain relief because they're pretty, pretty badly in pain. All right, what's this? Yeah, so this is this is the classic beaded appearance of the bile ducts you'll you'll see in primary sclerosing cholangitis. This is an MRCP image, uh, and what primary sclerosing cholangitis is is an inflammatory disease of the bile duct caused causing stricturing, eventual cholangiocarcinoma. This is their classical presentation, so it's super similar to gallstones, uh, but they tend to have like autoimmune features like fatigue and lethargy. Um, investigation, ERCP, MRCP, whatever's available. They might be anchor positive, um, and we don't really do biopsies for this condition anymore, um, but you, they get onion skinning. I don't think they're going to test you on that. Uh, do not forget the association with ulcerative colitis because it's incredibly important. Um, so remember, patients with ulcerative colitis are at risk of two cancers. What are two cancers are patients with ulcerative colitis at risk of? Yeah, colorectal cancer and cholangiocarcinoma um, are the two ones they're at risk of. So if anyone with ulcerative colitis suddenly starts losing weight, like that is, I mean, they're already going to be losing weight, but if if they if they deteriorate, that's super worrying. Um, a lot of these patients may also require a liver transplant at some time down the line. Um, before we go on to that, what other condition goes along with ulcerative colitis? So Crohn's is the other inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, but yeah, what I was looking for was ankylosing spondylitis because they're on the same HLA typing. Um, and what are the classical features of ankylosing spondylitis? Sacroiliitis. Yeah. And what else? Yeah, and they get like syndesmum formation around their back. They get back pain and back stiffness. Um, and yeah, all the all the six A's of ankylosing spondylitis. I won't go over today for the for the um, due to time. Right. So that's my half done. Let's should we take five minutes because I know that people like breaks. Last time. And then Ahmed has some history take to go through. If anyone doesn't want five minutes, wait, does anyone want five minutes? Yeah, fine. If anyone has any questions about other medicine, medicine stuff, we can answer while we're on this break.
is Oxford Handbook good for gastro? Um, I think it's, 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 it's pretty good, I think, yeah. Um, how quickly is someone supposed to have ERCP with symptomatic gallstones? Um, I'm not too sure, let's find out. Sorry, I'm like, it's really hard to remember like guideline things. I think it's as soon as possible and there's waiting times though. Can you repeat why you see an ankylosing spondylitis are linked? Yeah, so both of those, so autoimmunity, well, part of it is due to HLA matching. If you, for those of you who done renal, it's the same thing as when you're matching transplants, really. Um, UC and ankylosing spondylitis are both associated with a certain HLA type called HLA, HLA B27. So um, people who get one of them are more likely to get the other one. It's not it's not a hundred percent thing. It's just they are associated. Um, another useful thing to know in regards to that is um, if you have both of those conditions concurrently, that is an indication for anti TNF therapy because it will help both of them. Do we need to know about HIV um, for this year and what other rare infections do we need to know? Um, so you don't need to know about HIV, but you need to know about the infections that people who have HIV and are immunocompromised are at risk of. So things like pneumocystis gyrovechi, uh, cryptosporidium, uh, and then cryptococcus pneumonia, that kind of thing. So like the immunocompromised infections. Uh, and what other rare infections do we need to know? Um, I don't think there's like a definitive list of rare infections. The only reason I put leptospirosis into this lecture is because um, I think it's relevant to the context of jaundice. Uh, I think if you learn them less as infectious conditions and more as conditions to do with the presenting complaint that you're studying at that moment in time, it becomes a bit easier. So when we, like what other... So think about it this way: when you when you when you're learning about the liver, the important infections you're going to learn about are hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and maybe leptospirosis. Obviously, that one is less common in this country. The other thing about these infectious diseases is you you just don't need to know that much about them. You just need to know oh they're kind of in this part of the world. They kind it's just like classical histories. When do you do ERCP and when do you remove the gallbladder? Uh, I can't remember. Ahmed, can you remember? Uh, I mean, really all of these patients who present with cholecystitis or cholangitis will need their gallbladder removed. Um, with the gallbladder, I think it's if they present uh, if they present early on, then you can remove the gallbladder. The problem is if they've presented later on and there's a high level of inflammation, then you can't remove the gallbladder. It's too dangerous. So I think those yeah. patients will have an ERCP. And then six weeks down the line, once the inflammation is resolved, then they'll have their gallbladder taken out. Yeah. There you go. But everyone needs their gallbladder out if they if they um, if they've presented with cholecystitis with acute cholecystitis. Yeah. Spear sheet in the microscope. Thing. So was that the slide about spirochy, same as leptus? Let me go. Yeah, so that was talking about lepto. Yeah, so leptospirosis is a spirochete, a spirochete and causes yeah. those symptoms. Yeah. Um, yeah. With the. Oh. Sorry, no. Wait, you go through it first? No, you go first. No, I, I, I was just thinking out loud because I'm an idiot. You're not. We do all the time. Uh, with the HIV ones, basically anything that's relevant to the modules you've done this year, just know about that. So PCP, because you've done RESP because you've done neuro things like cryptosporidia and meningitis and toxoplasma but it, HIV itself is a fifth year topic you don't need to know about things like anti antiretrovirals and so on it's literally just like Anoush said if it's relevant to your module if it's an infection uh, opportunistic infection which is relevant to the modules you've done then know about it yeah I think this is probably a good time to just remind everyone that like infectious diseases is a two-week placement but infectious diseases is very much like a vertical like CPP-esque module. 
Like it comes up in every single specialty and there is a bit of it in every single specialty. It's much easier to learn a bit of it when you're doing that specialty than it is to mm. learn it as one massive block, which is quite mm. overwhelming. Definitely. Um, yeah. Uh, also, if if you haven't checked out the um, podcasts on Moodle about antibiotics, they are excellent and definitely worth listening to. I think it was Dr. Shetty. There are a lot of Dr. Shetty's. Well, actually, no, those are Mr. Shetty's at the work. Dr. Sh Shetty is a common Indian surname, to be fair. Fair. There are um, two Mr. Shetty's at the work who are spinal surgeons. Not related either. Mm. Should we make a start again? It's been five minutes. All right, let's do it. OK, so everyone ready to call? Everyone ready to start again? I will assume that we have. OK. So we've got uh, Miss Tyler, who's where's on Moodle, so it should be uh, on the Under Module Mod C, C Moodle page. Yeah. Mod uh, C infectious yeah. diseases. Okay. So yeah, so we've got Miss Tyler. She's come in. Uh, she's twenty four. She's come in with a one hour history, so it's fairly acute. It's really, really excruciating abdo pain, and it's her right iliac fossa. It came on really suddenly, hasn't radiated, and she's been vomiting quite a bit. She's got no past medical history. She takes a contraceptive pill, um, and yeah, she nothing else particularly of note. She's not allergic to anything. Lives at home, doesn't smoke, drinks drinks with friends uh, on the weekend on a Friday night. What sort of things, what, what what are your differentials here based on this information? I like it, very good. Yeah, see. So, no, that's, ve that's very, so Alexis, you've made a good point. Just because somebody's on contraception doesn't mean that it rules, it rules out pregnancy. So hope, you know, hopefully, hope is appendicitis because obviously that's much much more manageable but and as this was as the next slide was going to be let me just take control um as the next slide was going to be what's the single most important investigation as you've already touched on she's going to need a pregnancy test first you do not want to miss an ectopic pregnancy um, you can do you can do a urine dip for urinary HCG. A lot of people will throw it in the blood test now because you can pick it up. Uh, you can pick it up on, uh, in the blood. But yeah, the single most important thing uh, is going to the first one is going to be you want to do a pregnancy test because an ectopic pregnancy can present in you can well in any form of abdominal pain. If you know. If, um, it can implant anywhere in the abdomen in rare cases so definitely the first thing you want to do is a pregnancy test good so we've got that uh right so abdo pain is really really non-specific it's a it's a presenting symptom of at over 100 condition so what i'm going to talk about is approaching it systematically um because like you know like we said if it's a huge non-specific thing then you need you're going to want an approach in order to figure out what's most likely to go on so we'll talk about history first then examination findings and then the uh, investigations that you're going to want to do so let's say you've got a patient presenting with abdominal pain and I'm not going to specify the context, whether that's in a GP surgery or you're a gastro, uh, you're in a gastro outpatients clinic or you're in the emergency department. From the history, what sort of things do you care about? What, what's important in an abdominal pain history? Yeah, so it's a pain history. So it's so. This is actually one of the areas where Socrates is really, really useful. It, so, yes, yeah, so we, we want the full history of presenting. We want the full history of presenting complaint. And Socrates is really, really useful for that. But I'll go through other parts of the history and what are the important things to pick up uh, to pick up through there. So I'm not going to go 
Socrates stands for, because I'm assuming we've uh, it's something that was covered very, very early on in the year. If someone actually, if somebody isn't sure what it stands for, just drop a message um, and I'll just quickly go through it. Um, but out of those, character isn't particularly useful in abdominal pain, unless it's something like, oh, tearing abdominal pain, maybe this is a ruptured uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm. But the others are uh the others are quite useful so sight even though it can be a bit of a red herring is really really useful you're going to want to like you you can literally divide your abdominal pain in any way in several ways based on this is it acute or is it chronic where is it uh where is it um sighted is there any pattern is there any pattern to it how bad is it obviously if something is excruciatingly painful you're a lot more worried than sort of low-lying chronic chronic pain so yeah uh, oh wait sorry right. yeah that i yeah, yeah, yeah i've got I've, I've, I've got access okay so you do, so let's say you do you do your socrates history if you've got if and we'll talk a bit more about things like oh how you can you know how you can narrow down your differentials based on things like sight or uh, or onset or um, associated symptoms because associated symptoms are obviously a big bit. Let's say if you've moved on to your past medical history and it's somebody with abdo pain, what do you want to ask about? What conditions are important to inquire about? very very it's a very very broad question yeah so so gallstones which actually leads to the important uh, the important point which is have you had this pain have you had this pain before yep so inflammatory bowel disease okay good good i like yeah so like Issy said heart disease is actually really really important um it's very easy to fall into um to you know, to sort of get tunnel vision, and, um, and it happens a lot of the time. We go ab abdominal pain. This is a gastro cause, or this is something to do with the digestive system, or things like the abdominal cavity. Remember that the body is very poor in inter interpreting uh, visceral pain. For cutaneous pain, we can localize it to millimeters, but for visceral pain, the nerve roots have a very wide spread. So pain, pain to do with the diaphragm can be expressed as somewhere in the abdomen, irritation of the diaphragm because you've got a, a inferior myocardial infarct can come across as epigastric pain, angina can do it as well. So your cardio history is imp is important as well. Do they have risk factors? Issy mentioned, do they have, um, so in mesenteric ischemia, what's a particular cardiac condition that you'd want to be checking for for mesenteric ischemia? Perfect. Yeah. Thanks, Emily. So AF increases your risk of mesenteric ischemia for the same reason that it increases your risk of stroke. If you throw off an embolus and instead of going uh, th up through the carotids, it goes down through the descending aorta and lodges somewhere in your inferior mesenteric artery, for example, that's how you get mesenteric ischemia. Um, so we've said cardiovascular and we've said uh, your abdominal conditions. Any other systems that you're particularly interested in? Renal is good. So what sort of thing are you thinking there for renal diseases? Very good. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. OK, so we'll go through those. So endocrine causes is re yeah, endocrine is really, really important. DKA is an emergency and one of its symptoms can be abdominal pain. It can present non-specifically. It's not always the textbook. Um, person fe person feeling very very faint coming in with a fever and they've they've been polyuric so abdominal pain especially let's say in a young person who's had a sort of chronic onset with things like tiredness and so on really really important um let's okay so What's let's go through the, this one uh, by one 
Sorry, uh, what's the other really important non-specific endocrine cause of abdominal pain? Yeah, There's one other really important to, one. Just about to ask about that. Sorry. So yeah, I think hypercalcemia can cause it as well, but like, yeah, Addison's is super important. Yeah, and um, well, what is the mechanism of the abdominal pain in Addison's is likely linked to the hypercalcemia that you see in Addison's. Yeah. But okay, so I just need to scroll up a bit. So UTI was mentioned. That was that's really really important. It can present with abdominal pain in children, and it can present with abdominal pain in the elderly. It's not, uh, it's not just essay dysuria or something like that. Uh, Sarah, you said gynae, really really important. You do not want to miss uh, gynecological or urological causes of abdominal pain. It's easy to again tunnel vision, but they they can uh, easily easily cause abdominal pain. Um, other sorry, you mentioned red flags. What are your red flags for abdominal pain? What would make you really really worried for abdominal pain? Yeah. So, so ra yeah. So radiation to the back is concerning. Anything else? Yeah. Changes in bowel habit, especially in a sort of chronic patient. So anyone, anyone over the age of fifty, really, with a change in bowel habit, is high index of suspicion for bowel cancer. You want to rule it out. Yeah, anything of any perfect, anything involving blood, regardless of which side of the GI tract that's coming out of, if it's abdominal pain with hemochalasia or with um, or with hematemesis, uh, anemia is important. Yep, if they've got if they've got abdominal pain with an anemia, depends on the anemia. If it's an iron deficiency anemia in a man, that's worrying, uh, and weight loss as well. So your systemic symptoms make you make you worry. Um, would you, what about if somebody, if somebody has, uh, an, a, a, a history of cancer, would that, would that worry you? Why might somebody with a history of cancer present with abdominal pain? Perfect. Yeah. So if they've had bony met uh, bony mets and they've become hy hypercalcemic, uh, or like Sarah said, if uh, there's been invasion of a nerve. So the, the one that you want to consider acutely is hypercalcemia, but there actually have been causes of or cases of completely, you know, not being able to f find a cause for abdominal pain and patients going through many, many, many specialists until eventually it's found out that. Uh, let's say on post-mortem there was a tumor sitting on one of their splanchnic nerves for example so but the main one you want to worry about is met and that's the one you want to exclude especially if they're coming in with other symptoms of hypercalcemia if they're confused if there are behavioral changes um if they're complaining of other things such as uh, or they come in with kidney stones for example um but yeah right so that's conditions if we move on to uh, medication, so your drug history, what is your what what's going to be your top the first set of medications that you want to ask about in anyone who's coming in with abdominal pain? Perfect, NSAIDs. Yeah, you do not want to miss you do not want to miss somebody who's ha who's had a GI bleed. Because it, uh, it might not necessarily have gotten to the point where they're vomiting blood or coughing up blood, or they have Frank Molina, but they might still be they might still be bleeding, and it might still be might still be significant bleeding, just not to the point where it's in the right direction for it to for it to come up through the esophagus. 
So NSAIDs, any other medications. So what other medications or groups of medications can cause uh, ulcers in the digestive tract? Yeah, good. SSRIs and steroids. Perfect. Those are the two I was looking for. So SSRIs, uh, which can often be uh, often be forgot forgotten about in terms of a cause of uh, a cause of um, gas gastric ulcers. You don't usually co-prescribe uh, PPIs with them, for example, because they're not as high risk as NSAIDs or steroids, but they can cause it as well. Um, so we've covered covered those medications. So the ones that you worry about in terms of in terms of gastric bleeding, what other medicines might we want to think about? Some of them have already been mentioned earlier, actually, in the part of the talk that Anoush gave. Yep. Yep. So what? So anticoagulants because you're worried about bleeding? Yes. Involved in that, involved a large, a very lengthy acronym, and they came to, at the end of this acronym. Yeah, so anti-diabetic drugs. So anything which can, anything which increases risk for uh, pancreatitis. So your anti-diabetic drugs, like your sulfonyl and ureas, glycoside, uh, and your uh, thiazide diuretics. So you do want to, you do want to check out for those. Um, and another one which is particularly important in uh, older patients, actually is paracetamol because a lot of the time in um, what you might see in an older patient is an unintentional paracetamol overdose. They had some, you know, they had some niggling pain and perhaps they didn't know about the, you know, how many you're supposed to take in a given time and they take, they take a particularly large amount, let's say 16 tablets or something, which sounds unlikely, but it does happen. And they're coming in with abdominal pain. You're wondering what it is, and it turns out they've put themselves into liver failure. So also a thing to ask about if you if there doesn't seem to be anything else uh, going on. Uh, uh, so gynae history was mentioned earlier, and that's really, really important. If your patient is a woman, are there any other questions you want to be asking? Yeah. So, contra yep. So, are they using are they using contraception? Missed periods. Yep. So, chances that they might be pregnant. What else do you, What else do you want to know about? Okay, endo endometriosis, fibroids, and cysts is really important. I'll touch on endometriosis in a second. What else do you want to know about the periods? Yeah, last menstrual period. Sorry, I didn't see that earlier. So, you want to know about their last menstrual period. If let's say. I'm in GP and a woman's come in and she's complaining of uh, abdominal pain and I ask when's your last when was your last menstrual period and it was about two weeks ago what condition might that be perfect so Mittenschmerz which is Mittenschmerz which is occurs with the LH spike so about two weeks after the start of uh, two weeks after the start of the menstrual period when when the ovaries release the ovum so you can feel a sort of popping uh, popping pain which can be really worrying if you've never if you've never had it before but can be can be quite common so we've got last menstrual period and the other important thing with uh, with periods is is there a pattern with the pain and periods what condition is that relevant for so when when there when the period occurs the pain gets worse PCOS possibly, I don't actually know about that. Yep, yeah, endometriosis. 
Endometriosis is a horrible condition and there's an average delay in diagnosis of seven years. That means there's seven years between, usually on average, between a woman starting to experience symptoms and actually getting a diagnosis. It's often misdiagnosed, often missed. If a woman is presenting and you elicit that there is a pattern between her periods and her abdominal pain, please suspect endometriosis. It has a massive impact on quality of life. Uh, and remember, if it's seven years on average, that means half of patients actually are diagnosed after seven years, so even even longer. Um, so, so fibroids and ovarian cysts were ovarian cysts were mentioned as well. Um, if it's if let's say if let's say you're uh, seeing a woman in uh, a woman in her 50s for example and she's complaining of abdominal pain um, and bloating over a long period of time um, how do you investigate endometriosis i don't actually know because i was supposed to be on gynae now but obviously i'm not doing gynae now i will i will look that up for you and get back to you on how you investigate it um, it can be difficult because the problem with endometriosis is literally you have the endothelium of the uterus growing ectopically, possibly anywhere in the body. Um, but I will look up how to investigate it and get back to you. Um, yeah, so it's a woman, let's say, in her 40s or 50s. She's complaining of bloating uh, and a, sort of a nonspecific abdominal pain, which has been going on for a while now. What do you want to rule out? maybe if this was yeah ovarian cancer you don't really get ibs in your 40s or 50s if there's a woman presenting with ibs like symptoms so that's your bloating your non-specific abdominal pain and so on and she's in her 40s or above you should be considering ovarian cancer again it can be it can be missed and in the history if you are in the history for that you do want to ask about other cancers like breast cancer for example because ovarian cancer also is BRCA associated so yeah so talked a bit about the gynae side uh, it might not seem very relevant to abdominal pain but it is really really important because women do tend to get worse outcomes and their diagnoses tend to be missed Okay, social history. I also, if anybody has any questions about that, uh, again, drop them in the chat. I'll get back uh, about the investigations of endometriosis once we're done. Social history. What sort of things do we care about here? Yeah, so diet's important. If you're worried, if you're thinking about things like your um, like hyperlipidemia for pancreatitis or gallstone risk factors, alcohol's important. Remember, it's a big cause of it's the second largest cause of pancreatitis after gallstones. We'll also want smoking because if you're wondering about cardiovascular history um, with things like mesenteric ischemia, so. Occupation like working in a fast food shop, again, you're more likely to be consuming f food which is very high in lipids. Um, oh, sorry, one second. I... Is it not working? No, no, it's working. I'm just being bloody. Uh, oh, well, no. Yes, can you open the door, please? Sorry about that. I was trying to figure out how to mute my mic, but can't. Um, anyhow, yeah. So cocaine, good. Ischemia. What about? Because there's obviously another group of a group of conditions which will cause um, which will cause abdominal pain, and a new kind of mentioned you. They're sort of a vertical module sort of thing. You'll find them in every specialty. What sort of questions do you want to ask about that? in a social history. Yeah, perfect. Travel history and infectious, infectious contacts. 
it is really, really important. Uh, infections, a lot of infections will cause abdominal pain. Uh, yeah, perfect. So travel. So those are the sort of things that come up in your social history. Um, so this is, again, with non-specific symptoms, surgical sieves are uh, useful, particularly in things like abdominal pain when you're looking at the associated symptoms. So we could go through these very quickly in terms of, let's say, if you suspect there's a vascular cause, let's say something like actually somebody is having an inferior MI and they've come, they've come in with epigastric pain, what associated symptoms might, might this patient present with? So abdominal pain plus these symptoms, which might point you towards, okay, this might not be a, this might be a vascular cause. Yep, so your risk factors, but all about associated symptoms, so other symptoms the patient might be presenting with or complaining of. Yep, palpitations, good. Yep, so they're complaining they're complaining that their heart rate falls different or it's a sign that it's a sign that you pick up. To be fair, tachycardia as well is it will be seen in many things. If they're septic, for example, they'll be tacky. Um, but yeah, so you've got your palpitations, sympathetic symptoms. If somebody's having an MI, they might be like, oh, I feel, re you know, they're really, really sweaty, feeling clammy. So those are your sort of vascular ones. I won't include vasculitis under here because I'll include them under inflammatory, which is the next one. So let's say you have uh, inflammatory, yep, faintness as well. So your, syn your syncopal uh, symptoms as well. So let's say you've got your in inflammatory conditions and your infective conditions, what sort of associated symptoms will come along with those? Remember, these can be quite systemic, so especially with inflammatory conditions. Yep, good, rashes. Uh, what rashes are you thinking of in particular? Let's say if it's an inflammatory condition. Fever, good. So fever fever can be found both in inflammatory conditions and obviously in, in the infective, uh, infective conditions. What else? So what like, wait, sorry, so levator reticularis. Mm-hmm. What would you get? Like, what what would you be worried about if a patient with abdominal pain had levator reticularis specifically? As in, that's not the one. That, that that's not one of the important ones. But since you put it, I might as well quiz you on it. <laughs> Perperum pyoderma gangrenosum. Also, so if you're if you if you're seeing purpura, if you're seeing a purpuric rash, are you worried? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Levada, sorry, one second. No. Levada reticularis goes along with antiphospholipid syndrome, which, so it's one of the causes of like mesenteric ischemia. Yeah. But yeah, it's not that, yeah, it's not like super common in like abdominal symptoms. Yeah. Sorry, continue. And then, pi whilst I'm on, whilst I'm talking about uh, purpura, pyoderma gangrenosum is commonly associated with what conditions? So with a purpuric rash, obviously you're taking it into context with a patient, but if it's a patient who's present who's presenting acutely, or if it's or if it's a child, purpura and a child are always uh, always worrying. Um, so not IBDs for uh, for pyoderma gangrena. Well, one of the IBDs actually is more associated with it. Um, yep. So. Purpura in children, unexplained purpura and bruising is always worrying for ALL. A purpura, purpura in a systemically unwell person makes you worried about it makes you worried about uh, sepsis. So DIC, it, you become purpuric if you have DIC. And yep, yeah, UC is more UC is more associated with pyoderma gangrenosum. But I think if it happens in Crohn's, it's worse. It's also associated with rheumatoid. Um, so 
generally autoimmune inflammatory conditions tend to be associated with it. Earlier when I was talking about uh, the most common rash that you'll probably get with inflammatory conditions uh, to do with the digestive system. So your IBDs is erythema nodosum. So having a look at the legs is also quite useful. So we've said systemic symptoms like fever, weight loss, you might have rashes and so on. Trauma is trauma. Um, if somebody's come out of a car crash and they have abdominal pain, um, let's say it's left upper quad, quad, quadrant, you're obviously worried about a ruptured spleen. Uh, autoimmune is very similar to going to be very similar to the inflammatory conditions, except you're also going to be you're also going to be inquiring about other symptoms of autoimmune conditions because remember they cluster together. Metabolic. It's just such a such a broad range such a broad range of things that it's very it's it less the associated symptoms for that will be covered by specific. everything else. Exactly, yeah. Iatrogenic, you'll usually receive from uh, from the. It won't be so much associated symptoms as something that you'll pick up from past medical history and drug history. Uh, neoplastic causes, again, your systemic symptom, your systemic symptoms. Congenital, again, you pick up on past medical history. You will probably know if somebody is. Uh, you'll notice if somebody's come in with uh, a stoma in their twenty something, and they've had to. They, I don't know. They had to have part of their uh, part of their gut removed because of uh, something what happened. You know, something which happened at birth, or they have a a mutation which has affected the development of the GI tract. Uh, environmental is really, imp uh, is really important. A lot of toxins uh, will cause abdominal pain. A lot of the heavy metals will cause abdominal pain. That comes up in your occupational history. Uh, and then endocrine we've talked about. If you've ruled out all of the organic causes, then a lot of abdominal pain is functional. Actually, a very large percentage of abdominal pain has no organic cause behind it that can be found so you're looking at something which ibs is a very very common cause but also things like um generalized anxiety disorder is really is a really really common it's a really really common cause of abdominal pain so it's important obviously don't that's not your main diagnosis before you've excluded anything else but it's a big cause it's probably one of the biggest causes of abdominal pain um yeah your non-specific ones so let's say you know, if somebody is experiencing symptoms that wake them up at night, is, does that worry you? And why, if they're experiencing symptoms that wake them up at night? Yeah, so, so there's a big there's a big effect on quality of life. That's a very very good point from a holistic perspective. But from a severity perspective, if symptoms are waking you up at night, that means that the cause is organic. Fun yeah, they, it, the symptoms are severe, and it's definitely an organic cause. If it's functional, it won't wake you up at night. When you are asleep, you are safe from anxiety relatively. Uh, you're safe. You, you're safe from symptoms of things like IBS. If there are nocturnal symptoms, it's very unlikely to be something like IBS or anxiety. It's much more likely to be something or, uh, organic. You, and it applies to other spe uh, things. If you're being woken up by pain at night, it's far more worrying than if you know you can sleep through the night without being woken up by pain. It's one of the red flags for, let's say, back pain, for example, if your pain's waking you up at night. Um, if somebody is vomiting up blood, it's fairly self-explanatory uh, and why it's worrying. You're worrying that um, that they've got a, that they've got a bleed. And same thing if there is blood in the stools. Uh, if there is if there is blood in the stools, uh, and not Melina, and let's say it's a young person, what condition is that highly suggestive of? Yep, so you can get it with diverticulitis. 
but far, 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 let, let's say in a young person, young person who's complaining with bloody diarrhea, very frequent. Hemorrhoids, yep. But hemorrhoids don't tend to cause diarrhea. Yeah, you see, perfect. Thanks, Jaya. So you see bloody diarrhea is one of the typical symptoms of it. Uh, constipation, do remember to ask about if they can pass wind. If somebody can't pass wind, that's absolute constipation, and that's a lot more worrying. Because if it's constipation, but they can still pass wind, then you know it, it could be dietary because of fiber. Of course, it can be also more worrying things such as colorectal cancer. But if they can't pass wind at all, that's absolute obstruction, and that will quickly turn into a surgical emergency. Why would you ask about urinary retention? Why is it important to think about urinary retention? Yeah. So generally, you're worried about obstruct so obstructive um, obstructive problems, prostate cancer and BPH being the big ones. The reason why it's important is, let's say you have um, a man, uh, commonly a man coming in from a care home who is obviously unwell and is suffering with delirium. Uh, I'll get to quote Aquina, but suffer, suffering with delirium and can't verbalise. A lot of the time that's because of pain and one of the most frequently missed causes of pain is uh, is a full bladder it will compress splanchnic, uh, you know, on the compressed splanchnic nerves and so on and it can be missed so when you examine do percuss the bladder because if it's an old person uh, old person who's unwell and can't really communicate that will be one of the most common causes of them being in pain uh, and it's easily resolved you can put in a catheter and their pain will go away very, very quickly. Corda quina will cause both rete uh, retention, can cause retention, but mainly incontinence. Um, usually it's back pain rather than abdominal pain. So it's more of a back pain problem. And then if it's somebody with abdominal pain, they've got urinary urgency and frequency, what might you worry about then? So abdominal pain and the polyuric, they're having to go very, very frequently. Yep, UTI, pyelonephritis. And then the ones that you really don't want to miss because they're emergencies. Which we vaguely mentioned earlier. Yeah, DKA and HHS in, in the type 2 patients uh, can present with that and you don't want to miss them. Um, we've already talked about associated symptoms on these things, so sweaty, feeling clammy, palpitations, inflammatory, you have your, uh, you have your systemic symptoms. Remember, bloating can be a feature of some infections as well. The typical one, SBA is Giardia, so a person got, came back from... Asia six weeks uh, and uh, six weeks ago and they've been having bloating what's the most likely diagnosis it's going to be Giardia if it's an SBA uh, rashes we talk about erythema nodosum being the most, uh, the most common one if you're associating it with IBD uh, trauma trauma uh, and then autoimmune ha um, you're looking for your symptoms so Addison's for example will have things like your you know um Darkening of buccal mucosa, does urinary retention. Uh, yeah, so urinary retention ca can cause either oliguria or just full on anuria, depending on the extent of the obstruction. So usually causes oliguria. If they're completely anuric, that's bad, um, really bad. 
So they need a catheter as quickly as possible. And if you can't get a catheter in through the urethra, they need a suprapubic one, which is invasive, but it's really important because the complications can be really, really bad. Um, yeah, this mainly applies to mainly applies to Addison's, but also apply to diabetes as well if they're tired, malaise, weak. Um, yeah, so that we went through some of the other ones. Um, exacerbation of relief is actually also quite useful to inquire about, less in a uh, sometimes in the acute setting, but quite useful in let's say outpatients or GP setting. Uh, if it's responding to analgesia, that's likely to be a sort of inflammatory, more inflammatory cause. Um, you might not respond much, but some response will indicate it's inflammatory. If it's better after a meal, what diagnosis does that suggest? Someone's coming with epigastric pain and it's better after they eat. Yep, duodenal ulcers as opposed to gastric ulcers, which are worse after food. Why is that? What's the mechanism behind that? Why are gastric ulcers worse after food whilst duodenal ulcers are better? Yeah, perfect. So, yeah, so remember, you eat, your body goes, yay, food, let's have some gastrin. You secrete the gastrin acid, your stomach becomes more acidic, that's going to make it worse, but more alkaline in the duodenum, which which relieves it. Uh, on the topic of, of, uh, of secretions and so on, if I am a 30 year old man complaining of, uh, of uh, you know, lots of abdominal pain, which is worse after I eat and I've come in and you look at my past medical history and I actually had a prolactinoma removed five years ago. What might you be, what might you be worried about? What might you, th what might, what condition might you want to check for? Uh, so yeah so 30 year old man epigastric pain worse after meals and he has had a prolactinoma removed five years ago Hamza you should know this we did this like on Tuesday Come on, I'm rooting for you, buddy. Good, man. Um, so your multiple endocrine neoplasia in particular, um, so this would be men one. <laughs> it's all right, don't worry about it. Uh, in particular, men one. So you'd be worried in this case that maybe there's a gastronoma going on. Remember, gastronoma is the, the most common cause of Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, which is uh, multiple gastric ulcers related to excessive gastrin secre secretion. Uh, worse after a very fatty meal, you've got your biliary colic. Uh, what about positioning? If somebody cannot sit still, if they're writhing around in agony and they've got abdominal pain, what diagnosis is that typically associated with? No position is comfortable. Like No matter what position they're in, everything hurts. Not everything, as in the pain, the pain's always there. It doesn't get better at all. Yeah, so renal stone. What about the opposite? Somebody who can't really, can't move. So if they have, if 
you ask them to move, let's say sit up whilst they're on the bed or something, it's really, really painful. Which is really worrying. So not so much a condition in itself, but a, um, a complication. So if things present late, Yeah, thanks, James. So peritonitis is excruciatingly painful. Uh, patients will often find it very, very difficult to to any movement that involves their uh, moving their abdomen. So, which is most movements, sitting up, turning, walking, and so on, will be really, really painful. Uh, and then related to stress, that points towards something functional, so IBS, for example, or an anxiety disorder. Okay. Examination, we'll do that really, um, really quick. Shall we stop there for now? I just realised we've been going for an hour and 40 minutes. Okay, let's do that then. Yeah, um, I'm just going to put, a, like, we, we'll go over this another day. It's just like, I, I'm aware some people haven't had lunch. Fair point. Um, feedback. Yeah, we'll try and shorten it. Sorry. It's just like it's kind of like we want to like cover like things that are relevant to people on all modules, so it's kind of hard to stick to time sometimes. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll go through this next time. Uh, I'll also probably post a poll on the Facebook group whether people want anything on Monday. I know it's like a bank holiday, so we can have a break if you want. But yeah, it's up to you. And if anybody has any questions, just drop them in, yeah. and we shall answer. But yes. We'll also put the slides up anyway, and the rest of it is just, yeah. Um, it, it, some of you asked for slides, like if you go to the first post in the Facebook group, there's a link to all the slides. Yeah. Have a lovely bank uh, holiday. Also, I think the length is okay. <laughs> yeah, Um. it's just, yeah, I know that like a few people in the feedback last time were like, can we keep them a bit shorter? It's, it, it's quite hard to do one hour sessions, to be honest. We get to, we, we like going off on. Love our we love our tangents. Tangents are good. Yeah. I've never been on a gyne tangent before, so that was quite nice. To be fair, that was quite important, though. Yeah. Um, it's it's not a Google Drive. Let me link to it. Um... Oh, uh, no, my computer went into standby. Stop downloading. Damn it. Why oh, you do this? Sorry, I'm just finding the link for whoever just asked for them. Yes, guys. Um, Really general question. How did you guys learn? Do you want to answer first? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I like the answer I can give you won't make you feel any better, unfortunately, because I, I, I learned a lot by going in, and I know that that's not really an option. Um, yeah. Basically, go in, ask lots of questions. That's what I used yeah. to do. Um, there's also um. A question banks are good, as Ahmed is about to attest to. Yeah, uh, I mean the f the first the first thing I would say is uh, go for understanding, not memorization. A lot of people adopt memorization strategy during medical school. Uh, re like yeah, re 